Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Jackie Martinez and I'm a Senior Global Product Manager at New World Medical. New World Medical is a leader in developing, manufacturing, and marketing cutting-edge medical devices intended to alleviate the suffering of glaucoma patients globally. Today we're presenting our final episode of the Ahmed ClearPath Taco Tuesday webinar series. We're highlighting the Ahmed Clear Path's versatility and OR efficiency discussion presented by world-leading glaucoma surgeons, Dr. Allison Hall, glaucoma cataract and interior segment surgeon at Glaucoma Centers in Maryland, Dr. Jonathan Schulhoff, glaucoma cataract and interior segment surgeon at Brook Plaza Ophthalmology in Brooklyn, New York, and Dr. Lise Vasquez, glaucoma cataract and interior segment surgeon at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Florida. Just a little housekeeping before we get started, the webinar will be recorded for educational and training purposes. Please kindly mute your devices and if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. The surgeons will bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for questions at the end. Now, without further ado, we will turn our time over to Dr. Hall. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you, thank you, New World Medical, for sponsoring this evening. I know we just have 30 minutes. We hope this that all of you get something out of it. We appreciate you spending your time with us. And my co-panelists, Dr. Vasquez and Shulhoff, thank you for being here as well. Um, so I've been tasked to moderate the talk. We have a couple of key points that we want to get to this evening. Please feel free. This is supposed to be conversational. So if you have questions, enter them in the chat. We'll try to get to all of them this evening. So some of you on the call, I'm sure, are experienced glaucoma surgeons, implant drainage devices all the time. Some of you are new to it, some of you are residents. So we have probably the full spectrum of surgical expertise on the call. And so we're gonna talk a bit about the Ahmed Clear Path, which is coming up on its second year, and discuss some of the efficiencies in the operating room and some other few bullet points that we'll highlight. So we're gonna just hit a few um, items and again, ask questions as we go along. The first topic is how has the Ahmed Clear Path in, improved your efficiency in the OR? And I guess specifically, how has it in your hands, how does it compare to the other glaucoma drainage devices and, and particularly valveless devices you've used in the past? I'll open that up to the panelists. Sure, I don't mind uh, taking this one. Um, what I like about the clear path of, over the other uh, non-valve devices is that the plate is very malleable. It's thinner than the other plates and that allows us to fold it, uh, roll it, uh, and manage and handle it a lot easier than, than for example, the bar valve plate. When you fold the plate because of its malleability, then it allows two things. If you're using a 350, you can tuck one of the wings and then insert the, the one wing under one of the recti muscles, and then you can unfold the other one under the other muscle. This I think makes it a little bit easier uh, to tuck under plates, not just because it's malleable, you can fold one wing, unfold to the other side, but also actually the, the fact that they're thinner and the shape of the device wings towards the back make it a little bit easier on, on, on my hands. And uh, with the 250, if you roll it, then you can also use a smaller incision and a simpler incision than you'd have to do if you open wide uh, for a pyridomy. So if it's a 350, the malleable plate allows quicker uh, and better and easier insertion, which cuts significantly on time. And if it's a 250, then it's even uh, a little bit quicker than a 350 because you don't have to deal with the muscles. And when you don't have to go under the muscles, then that allows smaller, simpler incisions. And then to put the plate in the back in an easier way that fits well. The other thing that I like is not just that the plate is foldable, malleable, but that the eyelets are a little bit closer together than on a bar belt or other devices. And when the eyelets are closer together, you could anchor it through one single uh, mattress type of pass, sort of the similar way that we do um, traction sutures, you could do it back in the sclera between the insertions of the muscles and that with a single pass, you could get both and anchor, anchor it to the sclera with the knot already under the eyelids. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, I think for me, uh, one of the biggest challenges when I started operating at a surgery center was not having another pair of skilled hands to assist me, especially with 350s. I mean, for those of you that are residents or fellows that are used to operating with the trained glaucoma attendings, 
it's a lot easier getting the three fifties underneath muscles when you have another set of hands. And, and one of the biggest challenges coming out was, you know, operating basically on your own. I'm at a surgery center where there's a lot of other surgeons, but I was the only one doing 350 bar belts. Um, and it, it had a tough time getting the, uh, the bar belt underneath the muscles. Um, the clear path made it a lot easier um, just in terms of being able to position it um, and actually do it just basically with one hand. Um, I don't know if the Monterey's actually have, I have a video of my very first uh, 350 clear path um, that I was able to uh, record where we can show just passing it underneath. So this is just a very, very quick video here. This is my very first clear path going back almost two years ago. And you can see with my left hand there, I'm hooking the lateral rectus um, and I'm gonna just pass it underneath one wing. And then I'm gonna switch hands here and I'm gonna put the muscle hook in my right hand so that I can hook the superior rectus. And it's just so uh, malleable and, and much easier in terms of getting it underneath those muscles. You don't need the kind of exposure and the extra set of hands with the bar belt. I just found that I always needed the technician to hold the muscle hook for me because I needed two hands to be able to drive the very big stiff bar belt underneath both muscles. That's great. Thank you. Thank you both. I think the only thing that I would add in terms of improving efficiency, and you showed it clearly on your video, um, is the anteriorly positioned positioning holes really is a game changer. The implant is so much easier to suture to the globe than the barbell because it's more anterior, closer to the limits. So you only have to get about six to eight millimeters behind. So very yeah, good. Great. One thing I would ask, so in terms of the, uh, the rip cord that it comes with, are you guys rip cords? Do you not use the rip cord? That's a great question. I usually don't use rip cords for most of my cases, but I do like to leave a rip cord in a very select group of patients, especially patients that I think may go hypotenuse or after the tube opens, whether they can flatten and develop problems. And I think that the patient population that is at risk of doing that is elderly people that you think that the post-operative pressures with a tube may be too low, especially elderly people that have had prior exposure to mitomycin C. Um, in my experience, even though studies haven't shown it clearly, um, but it is a lot of surgeons that have put devices in an eye previously exposed to metamycin will see lower pressures. And with the 350 in particular, that the postoperative pressures are phenomenal. In an el elderly patient, I, I do worry that the pressures may go too low. So I do like in cases that I may leave, uh, that I may do a 350 on to leave uh, the rip cord. The other uh, category for me would be patients that have had a history of um, acute angle closure that are short axial length eyes in the 21 millimeter range or shorter. Those eyes, even though you can be a young patient, they're at high risk of problems like aqueous misdirection, AC shallow, um, flattening of the AC. And, and even though we prepare the most for those, it's they still it still happens. So I tend to do take as many precautionary measures as I can take, including leaving the rib cord and, and all the other measures that we all take, such as putting uh, sclerostomies, choroidal windows and stuff like that to prevent AC shallowing. But that's when I use the rib cord and I do like that it's pre-packaged in there. Yeah. I use it most of the time. And for the reasons you mentioned, Luis, I also conversely will use it in a patient who, in whom I'm worried that they may not be able to stand the level of pressure for the four to six weeks it takes for the bicycle to melt. So those NVG eyes where the pressure is 60 and the venting slits are only going to hold them off for a few weeks. I like the safety of the rip cord to allow me to pull it after three or four weeks if I need to get the pressure down. So both ends of the spectrum is when I tell yeah. you. No, it's interesting. I, I'm not a rip corder. Um, uh, so I ligate all the tubes with the 7 0 and then I actually use the uh, 10 0 wick through the tube. Um, I find that it's pretty predictable, not 100% of the time, but um, it's very rare that I get hypotony. Sometimes it doesn't give me a, as good of an initial pressure control as I'd like. Um, and so in those cases, obviously, you can laser open the ligature, you know, sooner than I needed to or that I would, would have wanted to. But um, yeah, I like eight to tube. So I'm not a, I'm not a ripcord user, but it is something that I, I think about trying. Um, and uh, that brings an important point. I, I don't think I would, I clarified. I'm with you hundred percent. I also ligate all of my tubes, even in those cases where I use a ripcord. I ligate every single one and I take the extra measure to leave the ripcord in there in the cases 
that I discussed, but um, in general, I will ligate everyone. And, and my go-to is also with fenestrations. And the fenestrations, I'm a, uh, uh, I don't know, it, it, I haven't found my way with fenestration. So what I'll do is I'll make the first one and look at the fluid rush through it. Just similar to Ab, when you're testing how it oozes, I take a look as, as the needle comes out to see how quick is the rush of fluid out that fenestration. If it's very fast, I'll leave it at that. If there's not, take a second. I usually make about three or four venting slits, unless I'm worried about a patient having hypotenuse, which is un unusual in most of my patients. Um, I'm looking forward to trying the wick suture that you mentioned, Jonathan. Yeah, but I think I actually have another short video of that as well, um, if you want to pull it up. Um, so you can see here, this is just the tube that's been ligated. I leave my Vicro long, just in case I need to be able to find it at the slit lamp with the laser later on. And that's just a tenovicral right through the tube and it may be a little bit. And you can see how the aqueous starts draining. So you can see distal to the wick, there's still some heme in the lumen, but anterior to it, you know, that's clear because the aqueous has started flowing through. And I'll just cut that and just leave a little bit of length. Um, and I find it's just a little bit more predictable. I'm usually able to keep the patient somewhere in the teens to low 20s. Um, and I can ride that pressure until the tube is ready to open or if I need to open it on my own, um, I can do that as well. Do you guys also use the uh, 7 vicro the same way to ligate? That's right. Yeah, we, uh, we use 7 vicro I'll go um, around once and then tie it uh, because if I don't that loop first in the test and then fluid still goes through and then I end up more time. If I loop it around once and then tie, I haven't found a, a case yet where I'm still testing and it's not working. And I agree with you 100% that... Um, you can use laser settings after post month one to uh, uh, heat it and um, uh, in the tube if need be. Um, we we have to for vicro in our hand have to go up a little bit on the diode. It's not like a nylon that's you know black and you could use like a hundred milliwatt setting with a vicro. We have to go 800, 850 or so on the diode to make it absorb the heat that it needs to widen. Um, and, and it's not quite, it doesn't snap like uh, the nylon does. It just, you put a, a few spots and then you kind of wait. And then I think it's a slow trickle that it eventually opens. So I don't blast it either. I just do a little bit and leave it at that. And I think that over time you tend to see that there is an effect. Yeah. And I agree. It's an interesting point with the, uh, with testing the tube. I don't know about you, but I found that with the barbel, I used to use a 30 gauge cannula in order to test it. But with this, I find that the 27 gives me a much better fit just in terms of testing that the, the tube is well occluded. Yeah, the tube seems yeah, a, a little more flimsy. I apologize, go ahead. No, that's okay. I, I agree, the 27 is a bit easier. Um, it's a little more snug and easier to test for water type cold. And um, can you repeat again the laser settings that cut off a little bit that you use to cut your vicro suture, if you need. You're using, you're using a diode laser. Did he, Dr. Vasquez may be frozen. I think he was saying he uses the diode um, mm -hmm. between 800 or so milliwatts, I think was the settings that he was saying he was using, yeah, which is what I use well. I okay. find you also do need to go up 800, sometimes even a little bit higher. Um, oh, you're back. I'm just unmute, yes. Sorry about that, I apologize. Yeah, the same, 800 to 850. Um, I usually will leave a single single shot. I won't go on repeat because I don't think it takes much. Um, uh, you can go, I, I use 0.02, but I think it can take longer times, like 0.1 easily. Um, and a few applications are enough to kind of loosen it a bit. Uh, what The only thing that I would advise is not to blast away. Uh, because it doesn't behave like a nylon. It tends to be more of a, you loosen it up and- uh, And yeah, more it, of a melt, it, more yeah. of a slow melt. I yeah, slow, exactly right, exactly right, yeah. Do you both use the uh, 23 gauge needle that comes in the package? Yeah, I like to take the 23 gauge. I bend it basically to a 90 degree angle um, and that's what I use to go in. The same, I, I like 
the 23 gates that's prepackaged and in general, I don't know why, but the ones that we get in the OR, uh, sometimes they're not quite as sharp. So when we're tunneling and entering the AC, there's a bit of a uh, resistance uh, as though some of them prefabricated come a little dull, but with the one that's included, I haven't had problems. So I, I, I don't pull another 23 gauge. I use the one that every single time has worked very well for me. That's another plus for me that I really like. It is convenient having it in the package. Can you show, I have a short, short video on tube insertion that shows the 23 gauge passing. This is a scleral tunnel on a 350 case. So I'm starting about five millimeters back. I have it bent. And this patient actually had NVG, that's why it's so bloody. So I'm coming in with a cyclodialysis spatula through a small paracentesis and actually pressing the iris down out of the way because there are a lot of PAS in the angle and it would be tough to get in without nick nicking the iris. So I'm pressing the iris back but the 23 gauge to your point is quite sharp. It goes in very nicely. And That's a nice one, trick. And I want to get that tube hugging on the iris. So I just push it down out of the way. The AC was a bit shallow in this case as well. That proline left right at the tip also acts as a nice guide wire. So I'll leave that in there once the tube is in, then I'll just pull it back. Do you leave any viscoelastic for your NVG tubes? Um, I do not. I do not. I haven't had much issue. I'm usually battling high pressure as the low pressure. Low pressure in my That's patient. a lovely video. Thanks for sharing that. I love that uh, technique and a lot of things that you did there were beautiful, including, you know, adding the viscoelastic to deepen the AC a little bit. Um, filling the AC with viscoelastic at that time is very appropriate in an NVG so that there's not a lot of changes in IOP that can lead to hyphemas when there's neovascularization. The fact that you left it there also um, acted as a counter traction a little bit, even though you're saying, yeah, the needle is, is sharp, so it glides in better, but it was nice to see that it kind of served also as, as a second pair of hands for counter traction. The, ace, the, the tube looks in perfect position, and I think what you said is also true. I hadn't thought about that, that if you li leave the suture in there, it, gives, it makes it a little bit more rigid, which mm -hmm. Sometimes we struggle with lung tunnels to get the silicone tube to get into the AC, especially uh, if the tunnel's not done just right. But that, that may help in many cases also. That was lovely. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Certainly. One thing that I'll do sometimes if it is a case where I'm going to leave viscoelastic is I'll actually put the needle on the viscoelastic cannula. And after my insertion, I'll have the technician, whoever's with me, push a little viscoelastic and kind of lubricate the tract um, because I'm planning to leave the visco anyway, it just makes my insertion that much easier, deepens the AC and also lubricates the track for the tube to go in. Lovely. I would just invite the audience, if you have any questions, to please answer them in the chat. Um, we'd be happy to answer anything that comes up um, and anything we've covered or anything you want to hear about with the clear path. Um, and to our, my co-panelists, just want to ask, what is, what is your long-term, it's hard to say long-term, shunt has only been out for less than two years, we can call it intermediate-term management of your patients with beyond that clear path. Is it similar to the other valveless devices? Anything that you've noticed that's better or worse? Yeah, so um, I think it, it behaves, you know, as well, if not better than, you know, the other non-valve. I mean, the big thing, I think, for those who are starting out and you know making the switch from the valved Ahmeds is just sort of to know how your management differs, right? So the Ahmed were really concerned about those first few days, making sure there's no hypotony. Personally, I leave viscoelastic in all my valved Ahmed cases um, because I wanna make sure there's no hypotony those first few days. But with the non-valved, it's really that point when the tube is gonna open. So either if you're not gonna open it by yourself, you know that point somewhere around five to seven weeks but you really need to watch them a little bit more closely, especially the ones that Dr. Vasquez mentioned where you're worried about hypotony. So, you know, the little elderly patient, um, you know, the frail patient where they might drop their IOP uveitics, I find tend to uh, notorious for dropping their IOPs low when they open up because they get a lot of inflammation. So it's really just about watching them quite closely around the time that they're opening. And of course, the main thing is that the, you know, just making sure that you recognize when the tube is open, um, Sometimes it can be a little bit more of a challenge. You know, we all know about the, the fact that it doesn't have the ridge that we're used to from the bar vault looking at the slit lamp. Um, but the bleb on top, the capsule is really much more of a low diffuse 
sort of capsule, um, which makes it, I think, quite nice in terms of the IOP and the sort of steadiness and, and patients just from a cosmetic perspective tend to like it because they don't have that big bulge um, that's sometimes pretty visible under the lid. I've had, you know, an 87 year old man who told me that I messed up his swag because I put a, uh, a bar belt in him and uh, he had a big bulge under his lid. So um, I think patients do appreciate that. I couldn't agree more. I, I agree with everything you said that the um, post-operative management is more similar. Let's uh, just uh, let's narrow it down to the non-valve devices because it's different the management for a valve device. In non-valve devices, um, it's easy. It's an easy post-operative management, especially when you compare it to a TRAB. So I'll I'll see the patient one day, one week, um, and I'm not. It, it's variable whether I see them in between that and around the time of tube opening, and that depends on um, the patient. Uh, demographics, uh, level of anxiety, what the pre-op pressures were, how many fenestrations and how they're behaving, how many meds they're on. All those things will guide the week one to week five visits if I do one or two or even more. But I'd say in general, um, maybe one more time in between and then around tube opening. And then I prepare the patients almost always. I'll say, uh, the tube will open at, at around six weeks because I like it with a Vicryl, uh, which dissolves in about six weeks. At that time, the pressure will go low, then it'll go high, and then it'll settle into a middle point. And we're hoping that that middle point is an excellent one for you. How long it takes, the low after the tube opens, maybe one to two weeks, sometimes a little bit longer. The highs could be uh, one to two months, and then we'll find the middle point, which we're looking at into three, four months down the line. And the reason why I say that is because a, a lot of patients get anxious when their pressures are back to 20 from a hypertensive phase at the time that they open, they think that there's something wrong and the tube is not working. So I tend to preemptively already tell them that that's normal. The tube is working fine. Everything's work going well. Expect that. And then uh, about 90% of people and I'll explain that in a second, about 90% of people will end up with very good pressures once uh, they get to that middle point at three months. And I use kind of like uh, TVT or PTVT. Let's talk about TVT data where it's about 10, five to 10% failure rates per year and it levels after five years. So it's about 10% failures per year. 90% 90, 90 of the people uh, with bar belts did well. And in my experience, uh, a clear path of the same uh, size plate do better than the bar belt. The clear path 350, in my experience, you end up with lower pressures than you do with a bar belt. And I think people have noticed that as well. And that's why it's being studied. I just saw a poster at AGS this year where small numbers, it was um, I think in the 40s range, but they compare bear belt 250 to clear path 250 and bear, bear belt 350 to clear path 350. And in both cases, the clear path pressures were better, which is what I see. And that's why I've transitioned to clear path in most of my cases. Great. We have a question from the um, audience. Is um, IOP the sole determinant in deciding whether to place a 250 or a 350? So yeah, excellent question. Um, and an interesting one, you know, there's never been a great study that's really shown the difference between in IOP between 250 and 350. But I think, I think most of us would agree that when we're, you know, aiming for a home run, I, I still think 350 is the way to go. And the way I kind of look at it is um, when I can, I do a 350. Um, and, and the reason for me not to do a 350 is usually when I'm worried about hypotony. So those patients, Dr. Vasquez mentioned, the, the elderly patients or patients who are uveitics or prone to low pressure for any other reason, those are the ones where I'll probably back off and I would do the 250. Um, and then the other thing that comes up is obviously anatomy. So prior scarring from prior procedures, you know, if I'm gonna go inferonasal, which is my second most preferred quadrant after supertemporal, um, sometimes getting the 350 inferonasal, depending on the anatomy, could be very difficult. So sometimes then shy towards the 250. Um, so those are some of the things that I, I consider when I'm choosing 250 versus 350. I couldn't agree more also with those comments. I, yes, you're right. Um, the 350, you're going to get lower pressure. So in, it, is the IOP target uh, something that, that guides your decision? Ab absolutely, yes. It guides our decision. When we want to go for lower pressures, 350 is going to get you there. 
Uh, but like we were saying, it's a patient selection also a little bit with the elderly and people that could end up with too low of pressures. There's a paper by um, Marlene Moster from Wills that compared in uveitics, just using that as an example, uveitics uh, and neovascular glaucoma, a lot of us will choose an AMID. Me personally, I will go with an AMID uh, FP7 for most uveitics and uh, NVGers, but you could argue maybe in some uveitics uh, that need long-term control, you could use a non-valve that's gonna give you lower pressures. Those cases, it's exactly for what Dr. Shalov said also, that I don't like that sometimes they end up with a, you know, big big bulge underneath the upper eyelid uh, with the NAMIT more so than a clear path. Then, then I, in some cases of uveitics, I will choose a, a, a thin plate clear path, but may not want to do a 350. Are, are both of you making clinics-based incisions? There was a lot of buzz at AGS this year about some people making their incision um, more posterior. Um, to yeah, I, I am still. Um, I'm making my peritomy up at the limbus. I'm a little bit more traditional with that. Um, even for my 250 clear paths, I actually isolate the muscles and kind of clean the edge of the muscles. I actually do the same with my Ahmed FP7s. You know, for me, I'm opening the conge and I'm there anyway. It takes me an extra few seconds and I just anecdotally, I find that you get a little bit less diplopia, I think, because by isolating the muscle edges and really cleaning the tenons, I think that's where some of the scarring happens that causes some of the diplopia. So for me, I do. I still open at the, uh, at the limbus and I isolate the muscles, even on my 250s and actually even on my FP7s. I, I think there is, um, it's not clear, it's not black and white. Um, I think you made great points. For a 350, uh, I open because I definitely want to make sure that I'm underneath the muscle and I want to make sure that the wings are well positioned. The 350 is a, a large device, especially in the anterior to posterior dimension. It's long. So I want to make sure that it's comfortable and sitting properly. So I do want the wide exposure. And in 250 cases, you're absolutely right that I think plate positioning and anchoring is key. If the plate is not well position between the muscles and it's shifting a little, if it's moving, I think that leads to more scarring and more scarring could lead to diplopia, could also lead to more resistance of the capsule. So I do like to make sure that it's really well secured, that it's not moving and that it's in between the muscle insertions, not too close to any of the two muscles. With a 250, I have used a fornix incision or limbal based where it's the, what the small incision that they use for that tackle technique. And I have a video of that, um, but it, it, it's nice. I think it cuts down on time, but uh, it's not for every single case. And you gotta be uh, aware of the problems. Uh, visualization of surgery is probably the most important thing and it leads to the quicker surgery. So if you're doing a small incision to save time and you can't see, you're, you're not gonna end up being a faster surgeon. Um, so, uh, a, a, a fornix incision for 250s, yes, it's doable. That's definitely doable. And I, and I do like it, just not for everyone. Well, it looks like our time is winding down, um, in terms of the last little point, and we've sort of touched on it regarding complications and diplopia. I know I'm looking at my series of, um, clear paths versus barbells, which I used for over 20 years before making the switch. And one thing that st stands out to me most is the lower incidence of diplopia with the clear path. And I think it's as you touched on, Jonathan, the, less, the lower, less encapsulation of the bleb may be the main reason for that. Are there any other complications unique to this device, um, which you're seeing more of or less of compared to other devices? Yeah, I would say that overall, I think it, it acts very similar to the non-valve that we're used to. Um, you know, it's it, as long as the management, you know, you know, sort of what you're looking for around the time the tube's going to open, um, making sure you're, you know, seeing the patient often to, to prevent that hypotony in flat chambers and, you know, sort of that cycle that we've all been in before. I think it, it acts very similar to, to what we're used to with the other non-valve. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think for those doing tube shunt surgeries, you know, the complications are all very similar. We, the big problems are corneal decompensation if the tubes are not well placed in the anterior chamber. 
Uh, that's something that's very important. And the management of that, I'd say, if you don't like the look of the tube, if it's close to the cornea, you could get specular microscopies and monitor that over time together with the pachymetry. If you feel un uh, uncomfortable with the position itself, if it's real close to cornea, you, you should consider even moving it, especially if that patient has a low endothelial cell count to begin with. I think that's a They're very wrong. good point. Yeah, because I think you can get to the point of no return. It's better to move it early if you see it starting to decompensate. I agree. I'd rather, you know, move it early. Um, you'll be saving a, the patient uh, a devastating complication if the tube's not well placed. Um, you know, be frank about it. I think, you know, we're human and and I think that they understand it well. In the cases that I've had it myself do it, I've taken them back and redone it and um, you're better off. The patient's better off. Um, safer for the patient. The other complications that we see with all tubes, you know, erosions, uh, that's not any more frequent with uh, this device because the tubing, the silicone tubing is the same dimensions as it is for the Ahmed FP7 and the bare belt, the, um, the diameter, the outer diameter and the inner lumen, lumen diameter are the same. So I think we've all um, adapted scleral tunneling and patch grass to avoid that complication, uh, avoid, you know, conjunctival erosions. The risk of diplopia, uh, I think you've made great points to uh, try and prevent and avoid. And I, and I do agree with you. It's, I think it requires a proper study, but the, the, the thinner capsules that we see with the clear path may lead to uh, lower incidence of diplopia. It remains to be um, uh, proven. Well, it looks like our half an hour flew on by. So thank you all for attending this evening and thank you to my co-panelists for joining me for us. I learned a lot, so I hope the rest of you did as well. Thank and you thank so you. much. Yeah, it was Thank a, you for having us. Thank you for having us. Uh, it was a pleasure and thank you to New World Medical for organizing this. I love to talk about tubes and do it all day long. Thank you, Dr. Hall, Dr. Schulhoff, and Dr. Vasquez for joining us this evening. For more information on ClearPath and the rest of our product portfolio, please visit newworldmedical.com and the Learn platform for training and practice resources. Happy Taco Tuesday, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.